here. Glad you're here this morning. I think we're missing a few due to it being a bank holiday weekend. All right. Uh, uh, as we looked through um, the list there, what I call the corruption list, and uh, I don't. By no means do I have all of my um, different Bibles. I have about 25 or 26 different ones that just packed away, and I didn't even go looking for them. Um, in no way are we looking at all of the problems in all of the Bibles. Now, we do know that there's a general problem. Let's, let's divide it into two categories, okay? We have one, one type of problem where there are missing... We call them verses. They're not just sentences. They sometimes carry several sentences in a, in a verse. But each one's numbered. There are missing verses. There are changes to words that are, as you'll see, as you've seen, that are just awful. And there are uh, removal, especially the removal of words. That's pretty serious. Okay. Now, there is the minor thing, which is, which is, uh, there are different words used. Okay, a translation can pick and choose between certain words. There are different words that are used. So this one is major differences, and these one major. This one we would call minor differences between different versions. There are different words, different style of, of print. For example, if you picked up an old 1611 King James Bible, it would be in what we would call, <coughs> um, uh, let's call different things, but it's a Germanic, it's a uh, Gothic style. The lettering is really fancy. All right. So people say, oh, nobody would read that. Well, people did. They felt that the Bible was so different, it should have its own type of font that when you read it, you knew you were reading a Bible, not a newspaper. <clears throat> so just because the original 1611 was, was using a special font, uh, and then now we don't use that same font, is not a major change, okay? That's just a style. So 99% of the Bibles that are put on the market today, that are bought by normal people, have these problems, okay? Most people say, oh, I wish it didn't say the. Now, we're going to sing a song from uh, Colossians 2.9 that says, uh, for ye are complete in him. And so the song goes, complete in thee, complete in talking to God, no work of mine can take, dear Lord, the place of thine, okay? So thee and thine. So people will say, Oh, I wish it didn't say thee. I wish it said you. Okay, all right. Every time they start there, this may be where they start, but they end up in Bibles that are completely messed up, okay? And I've seen that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody's got good intentions saying, I just can't read it, so I wish it was easier to understand. But then they pick up a Bible that is got, got major, major problems. So why does somebody stay with just the King James Version of 1611? Now, you're not reading the exact same one that was printed in 1611. It's actually the one that's printed since 1769. But why would you stick with that? Because it was, as we're going to look in just a little while, it was correctly translated. You can constantly go back to the read and go, they picked the right word. It may not have been the word that I like, but it is the right word. And style is, is, is what it is. Um, when Jesus would say something, I want to hear it how he would have said it in English, not how Joel Osteen would say it or how Benny Hinn or somebody else. So um, I'm just giving you the, the, when you're trying to explain what are the differences between the Bible that you're reading and that you're memorizing, uh, as a matter of fact, I will say this Bible is so much easier to memorize than the newer ones, the New King James or the NIV, I find that most people memorize, who memorize the Bible, memorize this one. Yeah, some people memorize the NIV and stuff, but it's just kind of funny. You don't know if you're memorizing the entire verse. You don't know if you're memorizing the right words. All of that to just open up before we go to the New King James. Are there, anybody got questions? 
issues about this. Okay, so now turn to the next page. We're going to look at the problems with the New King James. And I thought I had a couple of different ones. Uh, let's see who's a good reader. We'll get... Um, uh, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, Jacob, I will get you to read out of the New King James. <clears throat> and you'll follow along in your King James Bible. And these are only some of the changes again. So, uh, number one, let's start with Bill. What's the first problem with the New King James? Well, change words, change meanings. You will need a copy of the King, uh, New King James uh, verse for this. Okay, so A... Go ahead and read that as well. Um, is Jesus God's son or God's servant? In Acts 3, 26, uh, the new King James Version calls uh, Jesus only God's servant, but the King James Version uh, correctly calls him God's son. Uh, these are not the same. Which one is he? To the Muslim, Jesus is only God's servant. But the Bible says he is God's child, a son. Uh, change words like this make a great deal of difference in how we understand the passage. Okay, so let's all go to Acts 3.26. Acts 3.26. And let's listen to Yaku, give everybody a chance to get there. <laughs> servant Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Okay. Do you might see the word right off changed? Yeah. Okay. Now, is son hard to understand so they just replaced it with servant? No. As we said, all these missing verses are because of different Greek texts. Different, what did I say? Greek. <laughs> I was thinking of a T for text. Greek text. Different Greek texts than what your King James was translated from. And so in the Greek, for the New King James, they picked the word for servant, which is uh, like doulos. But uh, in, in Greek, it, from the, the majority text, um, I forget what the Greek word for son is, but it's the different word in the Greek. They pick and chose what, what they were going to translate from. So they didn't just say, oh, son. Let's, let's read from the King James. I'll read it real quick out of King James. It says, and unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So they're not picking an easier to read word, are they? They're choosing a different word altogether. Now, Muslims love that because Muslims will always agree Jesus was a servant of God, just like Allah was, just like Adam was. They call them all different servants. So um, that's one example. Number B, uh, Geraldine. B, do we really need to, to change all of the these and those to you and you? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, number one and A. Yeah. based on the New King James Version. So, and the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Okay, let's go there ourselves, Exodus 16, 28. And you're going to have to just pay attention and go, wow. I never saw that, and you'll, you'll be surprised, I think. Exodus 16, 28. All right? So now, uh, before you read it from the King James, I want you to look back at your, your discipleship. And notice it says, who is the Lord talking to? Moses. Yeah, and the Lord said to Moses. And then what does he say to Moses? How, in the Go ahead. So who is he accusing of refusing to keep his commandments and laws? Sounds like Moses, right? Yeah. Aha, ha. let's check out Exodus 16, 28 in our old King James. 16, 28. Let's go ahead, Geraldine. You want to read that too? On the old King 
out of the old King James. Right? <laughs> and the Lord said unto Moses, How long re refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? All right, go ahead, do be now. And in B then, it looks like God is saying, Moses, you are, you are continuing to refuse to keep my commandments and my laws. But look carefully at the accurate King James. All right, we'll read it again, see. See. Um, and the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? All right, D. Now we understand it was the people, not Moses, God was upset with. Hmm. Because when you say ye, it's referring to a block of people, a group of people. Okay, keep going, it's plural. And then uh, he would explain that ye and you mean more than one person. Thee, thou, thy, thine, doeth, hast, etc. Only mean one person. Okay, so when it has those funny endings on there, if I say, Lord, I pray unto thee, I'm talking to one person, okay? If I said, Lord, I'm praying unto ye, that would be really weird, okay? So, but when you say you, you don't know if you're talking to one individual or to multiple. We generally aren't that precise in the way we communicate. But when I hear from the word of God, when I'm reading, I want to know, is God upset with Moses or is he upset with just the children of Israel? That's why the ye is important. In your discipleship, sorry, why do you say ye and you mean more than one person? Because when you say, uh, will all of you, or if I said to a group, will you come with me? I'm speaking, you don't know if I'm dealing with an individual or the plural. It by, by meaning is plural for whoever I'm pointing at. So when I say you, it, it, and there's five people there. They're all going to look at me. And they're going to, and I say, follow me. And they're all going to follow me. Unless I say, no, no, not you, but you. <laughs> you it's, it's not conclusive. So you is usually plural until you define it and say, I'm only talking to you in the front row with the red tra uh, blouse. Ye is always plural. Ye is always plural. Okay. All right. So now one more. So, so when you say thee, thou, thy, that T at the beginning, it is singular it's one person all right uh number f yes keep going how do we how, how do we know the y is plural the, the t is singular it's that easy in the old english yeah. it was that way okay so ye versus um uh you know you and um uh whereas the so you'll see God talking to Moses and he'll say, thou must do this. And he's talking specifically to him, not to Aaron, not to Israel, but to him. Uh, number two, um, next, my brain is dying here. <laughs> Don't ask, okay? Now that you know that uh, what Jesus meant when he said to Nicodemus, marvel not that I said unto thee, Nicodemus, a single person, ye, everyone, plural, must be born again. Isn't that a fantastic? So don't be surprised uh, that, I was, that I said to you that ye, now who's the ye? All people, specifically, specifically, Israel. So he's not just telling, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses will come along and they'll say, no, born again is only for a select group of people. Uh, you know, like Nicodemus. It wasn't for everybody. It was only for Nicodemus. And you go, no, it's for ye. <laughs> it's for everyone, but specifically for people who thought they already were on their way to God. Uh, mm -hmm. Number three, Yaku. What Jesus said was, Nicodemus, marvel not that I said unto thee, all of you need to be born again. This is very important. Not only Nicodemus needed to be saved, but everybody, including him, needed to be born again. That's why Jesus used the singular and plural words. All right, now I forget. Uh, look in the uh, New King James, in, in John 3 and verse 7. Let's see how they handle the two U's. John 3, 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Okay, sounds like he's talking only to Nicodemus, doesn't it? All right, 
So now a lot of people understand it, but they can't point to it and says, yeah, but is it talking only to Nicodemus? And you may think, well, that's kind of crazy. Why would we worry about is it for everybody or for a few or whatever? It makes a big difference. When you start to look and you try to understand um, any kind of science, in which the Bible is the queen of sciences, whenever you say, you want to know precision. You want to know, all right, who is he talking to? Uh, let's go to uh, number two, Nita. Okay. Um, were many people peddling or selling the word of God in Paul's day, or were they corrupting it? Second Corinthians 2.17. All right, the New King James, while well, the rest of us are going to Second Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, so that's King James. We don't corrupt the word of God, but what does the new King James say? What does the word pedal mean? Going along? No, this is not this is not a bike. <laughs> a long time ago, they used to have peddlers who would stop down the end of the road and they'd have a bunch of pots and pans and and cure all you know, it'll cure balding and it would also get rid of mice and <laughs> they would be peddling. And the audacity to say we're not as many that peddle the word of God. You know who peddles the word of God? Rupert Murdoch. And people who copyright every one of these Bibles, here's this new one called uh, The Message uh, that I was talking about last week, Eugene uh, Peterson. And right on the top it says, copyright, where are you? And uh, it's got, uh, I don't know who owns it, Nav Press, whoever they are. Um, but this is a copyright. So if I were to write a study, say I would, uh, if I were teaching my discipleship and I quoted the message all the way through, I would have to pay them a fee for using their Bible. Same thing if I were to quote. Now you can quote reasonably small portions of passages, but any Bible except your King James uh, requires that after you have done so many different uh, copy and pastes, and you publish it and you make money off of it, you have to pay them a fee. That's what copyright protects. And that's not a bad thing. But when it comes to the Bible, they're peddling it, aren't they? They're selling it. The reason why there are well over 200 uh, new Bibles is because you can make money off of a Bible. Why are there so many churches? Because you can make money off of religion. And <clears throat> uh, uh, there is money in religion. Wouldn't you like to be in a church where everything's out in the open, it costs money to pay for lights, to pay for parking, to pay for electricity, to everything. So you wanna make sure this is just as bare bones and as servant style type of church as possible instead of bringing in the money, bringing it in. We are not as many which peddle and yet they're the ones that copyright. Isn't that interesting? No, no, no. I'm just saying the, jo the New King James and all of them say we're not as many as corrupt. And all of the new Bibles say peddle. Isn't that funny? Except the King James which says corrupt. So somebody didn't say, oh, corrupt's a harder word. Let's find an easier word. I mean, what's the easier word than corrupt? Ruin. Defile. But they didn't pick a better. They didn't find a different word that was just better. They found a different word altogether and changes to those words were, are bad. Well, corrupt maligns them. <laughs> corrupt maligns them. I mean, you know, because that's what... Well, they're they are corrupting, corrupting it and... and they're yeah. corrupting them. Yeah, and they're yeah. peddling it. But is this something that can be legitimately uh, translated? So if they're using the 
uh, the uh, Greek. No, oh. the, the um, was it uh, Hort, West Cotton Hort? West Cotton Hort text. Mm -hmm. Can they legitimately pull these words out? That word is in the West Cotton Hort. It's in Greek for corrupt, uh, for for uh, for peddle. Uh, okay. So when they've got the two sets again, everybody makes choices every day. All right, I choose. I'm going to have eggs or porridge or a bagel or whatever. I'm making choices all day long. Well, when you're a translator, you can pick and choose which texts you choose from. Almost all the new Bibles decided to go with these two manuscripts, Westcott and Hort. The New King James sat back and says, well, we'll use some of the majority texts and we'll use some of the Westcott and Hort. And they chose the Westcott and Hort one. Instead of corrupt, they chose pedal and they put it in there. So they're making choices all the time neglecting now that the majority of the text says corrupt, all right? Now, I don't know if you're following, but that's the business that's going on and you never know it, except you lay it all out there and you go, what is going on here? And the news media, social media, modern communication is never allowing us to go back and find out what's really going on here. We're told, trust the science. And I love science. We're told, trust our politicians, trust the doctors. But don't we ask for second opinions now? Third opinions. Mm -hmm. don't, because we don't trust. Well, you, you gotta be wise, especially even about churches and go, well, there's a minister that, that must be a man of God. Not always. It says church on it. It must be a, a holy place. Not always. You've got to check it out. And especially when it comes to the Bible. So number three, this one's gonna be interesting. <laughs> Uh, KJV also copyrighted. Nope. Uh, no. There are, like, like there are King James Bibles that are copyrighted, mm -hmm. but not the text, only the notes. Uh, so some, say some Bibles, you pick up a Bible, and it, it is a study Bible, and the notes at the bottom that try to explain what's going on, those are copyrighted because somebody worked at it mm -hmm. and came up with a system of explaining, and they deserve to be paid for their labor. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's okay but the King James text is not copyrighted. Now there is a protection on what they call the crown copyright, which means nobody can come along and take the text and call it theirs. It still is owned by um, the Church of England, meaning that they translated it, it always has to be associated with them. So say I went and I copied all the King James text and I put it and I said, the Ledbetter version. Yeah. I can't do that. It already is owned by somebody else. I don't have to ever send them a penny. There's no copyright that allows them to be paid, but it is a protection so that I can't come along and says, no, John 3.16 is my verse for God so loved the world. No, no, not at all. You can't. That belongs in the King James Bible, okay? So there is protection. All right, next one, Declan. Did we do, who did you, Nita, did you read yet? Mm -hmm. I thought you did. All right, Declan, number three. Number three, do people go to Hades or hell? <laughs> Matthew 16, let's go there, and 18. <clears throat> this voice confused me the most. Because this in the ESV Bible a while ago, the ESV study Bible, and Hades, that were, that was confused me the most. That's the only thing I noticed from the difference when I was younger as well, so. Okay. So Matthew 16, 18 of the King James. <clears throat> And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right, let's hear the new King James. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. <laughs> okay. Out of left field, we'd say, out of nowhere comes this word, Hades. All right, now nobody says Hades. Absolutely. I mean, an unsaved man stubs his toe. What does he say? The rock and roll people say they're going to party in Hades. I've never heard anybody say Hades in the rock and roll. They say, I'm going, I can't wait to go to hell. I, yeah, no, they, I, I, why are you listening to rock and roll? <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. <laughs> There's Bill with his wig on. <laughs> Maybe so, but I don't remember that. Anyway, before we lose the plot, uh, let's go to Luke 16, 23. The gates of Hades. Uh, Luke 16, 23. 
Go ahead and read that as well, Declan. Luke 16, 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and see if Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. Do you know who that is? The rich man. That's the rich man Jesus tells about a rich man and a beggar. And the beggar goes to be in paradise. And the rich man, it says, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. All right, now let's read it out of the New King James, the more modern, the more up-to-date, the more advanced psych psychology. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abram afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay, in Hades. All right, so Declan, go on and do A and B. The New King James Version claims to be more accurate because it leaves untranslated words like Gehenna, Gehenna, Hades, and Sheol. What do they mean? We will know from the King James the exact meaning, hell. We know what that means. Meaning is very important. When's the last time you heard someone, you heard someone told to go to Hades I'll see you in Hades. <laughs> and yet, every movie will say, I'll see you in hell. Uh, in America, they use, I'll go to hell. Now, those are awful things, but you'll never hear them say, I'll see you in Hades, <laughs> unless you're a rock star. I don't know. <laughs> I'm losing world. my memory, and he's listening to rock music. Okay. <laughs> 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 We're bombarded by it, though, in the shopping center. Isn't that awful? <clears throat> yeah. And, and hell is an awful word. Uh, it, is a, it, is, it is a word not to be on the lips of a Christian unless you're warning somebody to not go there. But they, they're using Hades as a place of... A fun. Party, yeah, yeah. That's, I don't mind. That's, that's not my point. I was just saying. But nobody, except maybe somebody on drugs, ever considers of another dimension. And so, but if you hear the word hell, you know exactly what that conjures up, okay? So, I, yes, ma'am. Does the, um, the Greek have several different words for hell? And yes. Do they, and what, are the, what is the purpose of the different words that they use? Or what is okay. the, like, the deeper meaning of each of them? All right. You, you, you have Hades. You have another place called Gehenna. Those are actual Greek words. And, they, and, and the New King James translators decided, let's not translate those into the word hell. Each word has a different slight meaning, okay? But the context always defines your meaning more than a particular word. So being in torments, uh, what a lot of people will say is Hades can mean the grave. Okay, death, it can mean that. Well, Luke 16 says, he being, in, being in torment, he lift up his eyes. He's alive. He's speaking. Nobody speaks in, in, in the grave. Nobody, nobody is in, in death. Somebody, you put them in the grave. They're not writhing in pain. No, they're talking about their physical body. It's dormant. So this thing has to be defined by context, not just because somebody says, oh, let's just put Hades there. Well, that makes it even more confusing. It's already hard. Now, the word, there's, there's a couple of words in Hebrew. One's called Sheol. And, and uh, that was uh, Tartarus and stuff. <clears throat> Again, the, con the context. The King James translators did something that a lot of people are afraid to do, and that is they made a decision that helps people to understand, all right, instead of trying to say this and this and this and this and this and trying to accommodate all the possibilities, they look at what's the main focus of these words, and the main focus is a place of torment, a place after death. So Hades is the place after death that is not in heaven. That is what Hades is, and so that's what hell is. Since it's not in heaven, there's no purgatory. It has to be hell. So it, it, uh, I'm just being honest with you and just saying they made a smart move, making a conclusion about something, because when, you, when it comes to heaven and hell, you don't want to give all these different confusing options, which is what the New King James does, where people say, well, the gates of Hades, whatever that is, Oh, being in Hades, in torment, whatever that is. And you would actually leave people with no, no grasp of the weight of each one of these statements. Whereas in being in hell, you know exactly what it's saying. So which is what Jesus was saying by the context, not just by the meaning of the word. If I say 
Define for me the word coast, C-O-A-S-T. Can you define it? Tell me what does it mean? The edge of land by the sea. Ah, <laughs> wrong. I can coast down a hill. All right, so my context helps me define the word better than just what the word means. Many times you go to the dictionary and there's like 15 different meanings for the word. All right, so you've got to pick the meaning that matches the context of so, all the words around it. Go so ahead. The, so so when every time the Bible talks, there is only one, though. there's only one actual, because didn't we speak earlier in the book about there's the hell at the end and then now, like... Wasn't there a kind of like a very angry thing referring to Revelation? Yeah, yes. So now you're asking, all right. And so according to, according to Revelation chapter 20, it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So it goes from bad to worse. So the doctrine of hell and the doctrine of eternal punishment is a seriously big doctrine. And you don't need anybody introducing the word Hades into that thing and confusing it anymore. So uh, hell is not even forever. Somebody in hell is waiting for the judgment. We talk about, oh, at the judgment, at the judgment. Well, there is coming a judgment, but people will be in hell waiting for the judgment. And then if their name's not found in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're cast into the lake of fire. So it only goes from bad to worse. So, so when uh, you have the picture of... Um, uh, Whoever was in hell, you know, and uh, I can't recall the verse, but uh, they were. Uh, was, was he in the lake of fire? The rich, rich man, you know. Oh, the rich man's in in hell. It yeah. says in hell. So yeah. he's in where he's in now. Yeah. All right. Was he, he wasn't there fire in that? Oh yeah, hell has fire. All right. But the lake of fire is worse. Of course, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, the idea is all right. How does this work? Let me just digress for a moment and try to give you a very brief understanding of these doctrines, okay? These are traumatic realities of eternity, of an eternal God. If I were God and I created the universe, and, it's, and that's the universe, all right? It is 15 billion light years, or they say 60 billion, I don't know. From side to side, it is filled with stars and planets and galaxies and and God created this entire universe. That makes God bigger than the universe, doesn't it? And if he created everything with order and with purpose and by design, he's intelligent. And he's not cruel. He's, he, he actually designed it so that it would, it would serve a purpose. It went wrong. His best creation was not Jupiter. His best creation was not a mountain or a lake. His best creation was a human being. And he created the entire world and the universe for he and his wife and his children. And they decided, nah, I want my own way. And went his own way and sinned and lived independent of God and brought sin into the universe. All of a sudden, the universe collapses in, is collapsing in on itself, corruption-wise. It's falling apart. And God is holy. He doesn't change. The universe has changed. You leave a pile of clothes on the floor for a month, guess what you're going to have? Rats. Okay? You're going to have bugs. If you, if you put a sandwich uh, on, on, the, on the counter and, and don't touch it for a month, you're going to have mold. Everything decays. Everything falls apart. God doesn't. God is outside of his universe. If he is that big, if he is that holy, if he's that smart, he's got to be judge. And when he judges... It is serious. You don't cross him. That's why I got saved. He's right. I've been wrong. I'm not always wrong, but I've been wrong in enough that I could never earn a place with God. So what God did, he entered into the universe and died under his own wrath so I could be forgiven. That's the gospel. And when people understand that, then we understand why would anybody want to reject him? If you don't want to be with God, where's the other place? This is what people want. I just want to die and it'd be over with. But you were made in the image of God. You were made to live forever. He designed you to live forever. When they made this watch, I'm glad Apple designed it to last five, 10 years. Well, God designed you to live forever. He didn't want you to go to the grave and become worm food. But you choose 
And that's why we take Christianity seriously. It's why we take Christ seriously because people do end up in hell. And we can make a small difference in somebody's life so they understand they don't have to go there. So does that make sense? Yeah. So when we talk about hell and the lake of fire and the judgment of God, we're talking about a big issue and the new versions mess that up. Aren't they corruptors? Instead of the simplicity of don't go to hell. Can you imagine sitting down with somebody saying, I hope you don't go to Hades, but definitely don't go to hell. <laughs> And, 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 and worry about Gehenna and uh, make sure you don't go to Shoal. You see, that would totally confuse somebody. King James translators kept it simple and just said, don't go to hell, amen? But do you know, sorry, in majority text, would it be Gehenna and Hades? And it Shoal? is Hades and Gehenna. Okay, so it's, and so it's just not only in the, you know, the other um, texts, that the other Bible, so it's in majority text. Or they would do away with the word, the word's being deleted, and they got rid of hell. And so in the new Bibles and in the new text, you won't even find the word Hades in there, okay? So it gets complicated. But so, if, if they use different words in the majority text... Uh, no, they don't use different words. Then, when it comes to Hades and Gehenna, those words are there. Yeah. And they, Gehenna, if I can just say this, Gehenna was a fire pit right outside of Jerusalem. In the old days, we're going back thousands of years, or even 500 years, everybody took their rubbish out to the city dump and burned it, okay? That's what you did with your, can you imagine all, all, of, the, all of the slop, all of the, the, um, uh, the rubbish that just came out of your house, you take and you dump on the, on the uh, Gehenna pit. Gehenna was a little area, and they, they, they burned that, and it was a fire that never went out. It was always burning. And so Jesus would talk about hell like Gehenna. And it stank. And everybody instantly knew, oh, this is hell. So it wasn't that the word Gehenna is just a different word for hell. It is, but it is. it, it brought up all new ideas of, oh, boy, hell is not a place to go to. It stinks. It rots. It, the, if anybody ever fell in that thing, they would die. And it would be horrible death. I almost read a parable in the sense that I used what they knew to describe it to them. Something that they could never conceive of. Yes, he always uses a present reality, a present tense object to teach about something that was spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. But isn't there something in the Bible that gives reference to the different levels of hell? You know, mm, levels not of to the levels of hell, but to the levels of punishment. The Bible says that the Pharisees would receive the greater damnation. Now, when you, start to, when you try to figure that out, what does that mean? I don't know. But I mean, if I'm, if I'm in hell, why in the world would I worry about whether somebody's got it worse than me? <laughs> it's very hot at the door. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not so hot at the top. I don't get it. Okay. All right. We got to finish this. Uh, one question. Sorry. Go ahead, Geraldine, and then I'll come to you. Um, first, the question has come up with purgatory. Then. Sorry? Is there a wrong Sorry? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, the they don't get it. Uh, they don't. They didn't get it from anybody except some theologians, who came up with a series of different layers. Okay, Dante's Inferno was a Catholic convention where he had seven layers. Purgatory was invented because they're trying to understand. All right, here are people who aren't bad enough for hell, and he and they're not good enough for heaven. They're not saints. Where are we going to put them? So they invented purgatory, and they made a lot of money out of it because when you die. The Catholic idea is you better have some faithful people praying for you to get you out of purgatory and into heaven. And so everybody who says, well, I'm not bad enough for hell, but I'm definitely not good enough for heaven, so I'll just go to purgatory and have some suffering for a little while before I go straight to heaven. And they invented it. Same way that they invented limbo. Limbo was a dark ages invitation, uh, uh, um, creation of, uh, or invention of uh, here are these women who were having stillborn babies, and they were having babies that only lived for a month. We got to remember our our um, uh, mortality rate of children is really low. Isn't it wonderful? Most women who have babies get to keep them, but it wasn't like that during the Dark Ages. One in three, one in four would die, and so the priests were constantly paid to rush to. The, the, the birth of a baby to baptize that baby as fast as possible so that baby could go to heaven if it died. And they made the money. 
in the event. Because here's a mom whose baby dies and didn't get baptized. And now she's told they're not in heaven. They're not in hell. They're floating around with, with nothing. They, they'll, no, you'll never meet them again. And they're in between. And it was a torrent, torment to the mothers. And so they demanded the priest to come right after the birth and instantly baptize them. And that's how they kept everybody in the Catholic Church by making sure everybody was baptized instead of you gotta, be, you gotta believe and then get baptized. Don't worry about purgatory, don't worry about limbo, worry about hell. And that's it, okay? Yes, last one, we've gotta quit. The difference between hell and like a fire, for me, it's me and Okay, we would have to take some time. Uh, we actually, one of the discipleship describes the difference between the two as you get down into what's called the future, the section is like lesson 19. Uh, on the future. And so just, just uh, uh, Jesus says this. He says, hell was created for the devil and his angels. It was not created for man. So when Adam sinned, he took on, he, he took the consequences to join the devil in, a, in, in hell, which was going to end up in the lake of fire in the future. And it's called God's big plan. God worked this thing out so he gives man plenty of time to repent. And he goes through what are called dispensations and, and seasons of, of history, trying to get man to, to not, to not um, uh, live without him. And it's try, like trying to live without breathing. You can only do it for so long until it starts to hurt you. And ultimately, even hell is not the final end. The lake of fire is. So it, the lake of fire is not the big deal, okay? Lake of fire is the end result of somebody who goes to hell. The, the big deal is that somebody will, will when, the moment they die, they either wake up in heaven or they wake up in hell. And then they're never, they're never gonna get better. It'll only get worse. And that's the terror of it, okay? If you wanna explain about the lake of fire, it's just, it, it's just the bigger deal. They're both fire. It's a, it's a spiritual dimension of, you know, you're out of this dimension. Your, your own flesh is not burning, but your soul is burning, all right? You've been hurt with a word. Somebody said something that was cruel and it hurt you on the inside, didn't hurt you physically. Well, think about it hurting you in your spirit. What if it just burns you if something actually, and that's the punishment of hell. So it's a good study to do. I just have to leave it for later because uh, we're not there yet, okay? We will stop there and... Uh, uh, next week, we won't have discipleship because next week is what? What's happening next week? Church anniversary. So we are starting. Let me quit this here.